Chapter 11 The only sound that could be heard in the dining hall was the soft clicking and clinking of silver eating utensils against the polished surface of the carved horn plates. It was a rather elegant dining set. You would be hard-pressed to find a finer one without the owner being nobility. Most people simply used wooden or earthen plates and bowls, as well as iron cutlery, which always left a taste on the food when you ate with them. Druid had always thought it was particularly stupid and pointless that the old man had taught him proper etiquette for eating in fine houses and establishments. After all, when was a swordsman going to need to eat proper? It had nothing to do with the blade, or at least, he hadn't thought it had. And yet here he was making sure to eat food in the proper order, only using curtain forks and spoons for certain types of foods, all the while sitting straight and making polite conversation. Thank the goddess for the old man. As he worked to remember all the proper utensils to use in each situation, like that damn salad fork that was not to be used on anything else, despite the fact that it was a perfectly good fork and physically able to do anything any other fork would do, when Mistress Yena turned towards her daughter, she was seated across from Durin on the other side of the table, next to her mother. Durin had the pleasure of being seated on the left side of her father, which was the most tactical and honoured position, due to the fact that most swords users were right-handed, and so the blade was on the left side of their body, thus giving the person on your left more of a warning should you draw, and potentially allowing them to prevent the drawing altogether. Not that it mattered in this case, seeing as he wasn't wearing a sword. How is Solvi doing? You went to see her last night, didn't you? Lysica nodded sadly, looking down at her food for a moment to collect her thoughts, before she answered. Yeah, I went to the Healers Hall. She's bad, Mum. Lysica took in a shuddering breath, stealing herself before she went on. They are pretty sure she's going to make a full recovery. The order's covering the elixirs, but the Menders don't think she'll be able to do order work again. Oh, the poor thing. Lady Yena covered her mouth with her hand, looking over at Lysica as though she was the one who had been injured. How is her family taking it? They don't know yet. She is from Don Elias. Michaeline sent word via order courier, but it will be a full week or more before they hear, and then another if they write back right away. We will have to make sure to keep her company. She shook her head, and with a visible effort she changed the subject to lighter matters. So, Durin, Lysica said, when did you start learning the sword? I don't really remember, to be honest, he said with a shrug, as he set the knife down carefully on the table in its designated spot, after having used it to cut the smoked pork. The old man said one day when I was young I came out and saw him at his exercise, found a stick and started copying him. I suppose he decided if I was going to do it, then I needed to do it right, so he started training me then. He smiled, his eyes distant with memory. I don't actually remember the event, but that was how he told it. I must have been free, perhaps a little younger. He shrugged. Some of my earliest memories are of training. And your mother let him do this? It was Lady Yena's turn to speak. I didn't let Lysica even touch a training blade until she was eleven. She shook her head. She must have been quite displeased with him. My mother passed away shortly after I was born, Durin said with a polite smile. Oh! Mistress Yena covered her mouth with a look of distress. I am so sorry. It's fine, to be honest. I don't really remember her. I was too young. All of my memories are just of me and the old man. There was silence for a while before Liska asked the next question. If, if it is not too difficult to say, how did your mother pass away? She asked the question softly, like she was afraid of the answer. Bandits, Duran said. He missed the whining of eyes across the table as he was cutting another bite off the rather delicious pork. He brought the bite up to his mouth and chewed for a moment before continuing. The old man said he found her after she had been shot twice with arrows, said she had fled and carried me away, blocked the arrows with her own body to protect me. He got there right before she died. He sighed, wondering once again why he didn't feel remorse when he heard or told the story. It was like it had happened to someone else, like it wasn't his own mother. I had heard the Wilderlands are wild, but... Mistress Yena... It can be for those untrained, he said with a smile. There was no more talking while they ate for quite some time. The old man had driven into him time and time again that he was supposed to compliment the home or furnishings or dining items when staying as a guest in another's house. So as the sign stretched, he cast his eyes around, searching for something nice to say. His eyes once again landed on the polished horn platters and bowls, and he smiled at Lysica's mother. You have quite a nice dining set, 
he said, as she looked up and offered him a tentative smile. I'm sure only nobles would own a nicer set. Michael Lean, who had been in the middle of drinking a cup of fine wine, started choking and spluttering. His coughing fit spraying a fine red mist over the white tablecloth and prompting a passing maid to pat him on the back in an attempt to clear his airways. Master Galen, who had up to this point been silent as he ate, slowly cutting the meat with a knife and stabbing at it with what Durin thought was way too much force, closed his eyes, his jaw set as he breathed in and out with quick motions. The knife in his left hand shaking in his grip let out a low sound, like a wounded animal backed in a corner or something. Durin was about to ask him if he was all right when Lysica spoke up again. So, Durin, this is your first time in Kodala? she asked, a little too quickly in Durin's opinion. He turned to look at her and nodded. Yes, it's actually my first time to any large city. I've been with the old man to the markets in Valheim, but that is nothing compared to this. He shook his head and looked back at her. I would very much like to see more of it. Perhaps you could show me around some. Lysica blushed slightly before nodding her head. Mistress Janian narrowed her eyes speculatively and glanced back and forth between her daughter and Durin, a small smile on her lips. We should be able to look around some. After all, we need to get brooches and tassets, she said, her cheeks growing even darker. Brooches and tassets? he asked. And both Lysica and Yena looked up at him with surprised looks on their faces. Apparently it was something he was already supposed to know, not really knowing how to resolve this situation. He simply fell back on being honest with them. I of course know what brooches and tassets are, but I am unfamiliar with the reason for needing one. I apologise if my ignorance is offensive in any way. Uh, no, 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 Lady Yena said, waving her hands back and forth in a placating manner. You just told us that you lived practically your whole life in the wilderness with your father. It is understandable that you would not know. They are simply traditional engagement gifts given by both sides. It was about to correct her that the old man was not his father when she continued speaking before he could. Traditionally speaking, men would give a woman they are betrothed to an unadorned clasp or a brooch. She brushed aside her hair and pointed to the silver brooch pinned on her left side, near her collarbone, clearly displaying her family crest. It is a representation of the promises you would exchange at marriage, she explained. The clasp or brooch is a representation of your oath to care for your spouse. She said slowly, like she was explaining something that should be common knowledge. It remains unadorned while you are betrothed, but once you are married, you will place either your father's crest or our family crest, whichever house is the most prestigious. There was a hard thunk on the table, as Master Galen placed his wine goblet down with much more force than necessary. Everyone turned to look at him, and as they did so, he looked Durin in the eyes. If, by the goddess's own grace, you somehow managed to get to that point... It will be my crest that will be on the brooch, seen as you are a nobody. There was a pregnant silence for a moment, as everyone turned to Durin, who nodded his agreement. The old man has always told him that no one gets recognition unless it was earned, and seen as he had yet to do anything of note, Lysica's father was correct. At the current time, he was nobody. You are correct, he said, nodding his head appreciatively towards Lysica's father. As of yet, I have not done anything worthy of that honour. I will make sure to do something worthy of having the old man's crest engraved before the betrothal period is finished. Not noticing the flushing look of anger on Master Galen's face, he turned towards Lysica and her mother. So, I am to purchase a brooch. What about that tasset you mentioned? He asked, and she nodded. Lysica's cheese growing a darker shade, everyone ignoring the sound Master Galen made as he sorted his pork with much more intensity than cutting the soft meat should have required. The tacit is an order of Odan tradition, when two members get betrothed. It's not strictly required like the brooch, but I would like to get them. She paused to take a drink of the wine before continuing. It is a small piece of armour that covers the hip or upper leg. In this case, it is meant to symbolise the fact that each party in the betrothal wishes to protect each other. Granted, the actual piece of armour is small, more decorative than anything. Almost any armour is, seen as armour in general is counterproductive in our line of work. She gave a shrug. It was supposed to look half-hearted or casual but simply came off as jerky or nervous. She will also buy them for you, though traditionally a betrothal pair only purchase the brooch for each other. As Lysica said, there are separate additions that are sometimes added to that, Mistress Janus said. I see, he said, thinking a moment. Would you like to go and get some of these after we finish eating? He asked Lysica. She froze a moment before nodding her head with a sharp movement. Doubtful that you can afford one, Master Galen growled. Husband! Yena snapped at him. No, he said.
slamming both of his hands down on either side of the table and turning to look angrily at Durin. Do you even have any coin? he asked. But before Durin could answer, he went on. You lived in the wilderlands, after all, out there with the barbarians and the murderers and monsters. Do you even know how to use coins? Durin closed his eyes, breathing deeply for a moment to calm himself before he responded. Yes, Master Galen, I both have and know how to use money. As I have said, I have been to the Marcus in Valheim, and I am fairly proficient in spending coin, he said. And I brought some coin with me. Galen opened his mouth to say something, but before he could, Michaeline spoke up. That reminds me, the guild rewards confirm kills and monsters. The Cyclops you down should more than pay for it, you shouldn't need to spend any of your own money. He smiled at Durin, pointedly ignoring his uncle who was fuming at the moment. We would of course need to go back to the Alders Hall to cash it in before you two went shopping. He smiled. Lysica's eyes lit up as he mentioned returning to the Alders Hall. It was growing more and more apparent to Durin that she didn't relish her time here much. While we are there, we can perhaps pick up a contract? Lysica asked, looking at Durin hopefully. He smiled back at her and nodded. That sounds like an excellent idea, he said with a smile. After all, as the old man said, it is always best to have a plan, even if your plan is to have no plan. The three of them quickly finished lunch and bid their farewells to Liska's parents. Her mother bid them a fond farewell and asked them if they would like to join them for dinner, which Durin courtesy accepted, as he didn't want to seem rude. The guard at the gate opened it for them without even asking. Apparently you needed to ask for entrance, but go leave at any time. Durin nodded to the man, and then they were through the gates and back into the street, stepping down from the cobbles of the walkway to the hard-packed dirt and gravel that made up the road proper. Order hall first, Michaelene asked, looking over at Durin, who pulled his pack off, placing it on top of a road-covered patch of smooth, hardened dirt, and rubbish through it. He pulled out the small pouch of coins that the old man had insisted he take. Originally he had planned to simply take some food and make his way in the world on his own, but the old man had practically dragged him inside, pulled out a medium-sized chest from an alcove and opened it up. Inside had been full of gold ticks, silver trill and copper tarns were in the larger chest next to it. The tarns were simple circles, cheaply made, and sometimes the front and back imprint wasn't even lined up properly. No doubt due to the amount that needed to have been pressed, seeing as it was the most common coin. Trill coins were more expensive, having been made out of silver, and while still retaining the circular shape of tarns had different imprints, and it was always rare to find a misaligned trill. Tigs were gold, pure gold, and were circular with the exception of three holes, two on opposite sides, that took out a chunk of coin and a small drilled hole at the top so that a leather thong or string could be rung through them. The old man had always done that, said that was the most useful way to carry money was to string it around his wrist as it freed the hands up, allowing him to use his blade whenever he needed to or wanted to, and it meant he didn't have to carry a coin purse around. It always held that the sound of that much money jingling around gave him a headache. If something cost more than the amount of ticks he could string on his wrist, then it was a want, not a need. The old man had simply plunged his hand into the coins and pulled out a fistful, tossing them into a bag for Durin. And then he pulled out a trunk nearly twice the size, this one coming up to Durin's waist and said, You'll need change. Opening it, and giving him a double fistful of silver trills and copper tarns. This was the coin purse Durin pulled out, and opening the string, he looked at it, and then looked at Michaeline. How much would really good ones cost? He asked. And Michaeline shrugged. You are asking the wrong guy, he laughed. Unlike you, I tend to avoid marriage like the plague. I like women, but I'm not ready to be tied down. At least not in that way, he smirked, and Liska gave him a disgusted look. A good pair will likely cost around a tig, she said, looking back at Durin. Oh, he said. We can go and get... No, no, Durin laughed, reaching in and pulling out five ticks and stringing a piece of leather through them before tying them around his wrist. I was just surprised it was so affordable. I was expecting it to be a lot more, to be honest. Both Liska and Michaeline's eyebrows were raised, as they looked at him casually, pulling out what had to be three months of solid work or so if they never spent a ton on anything, and casually tying them on his wrist. And that was that. Let's get those first, 